to the Lens Rentals Podcast, where we talk about images and the people who make them. I'm Roger Sakala, the founder of LensRentals.com. Good day and welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. I'm Roger Sakala, the founder of Lens Rentals. With me in studio, I have Joey Miller, who basically has different perspectives for me, so he's fun. <laughs> and our guest today, I'm really pumped about because it's Scott Kelby. Woo! And I don't even pretend to not be a fanboy. I've been a fanboy since the turn of the century uh, when I was teaching basic Photoshop skills and his books made me look like I knew what I was talking about. Since the 1900s? No, no <laughs> the 2000s. I am old. Wow. I'm not quite that old. But back in world, back in World War II, when men were iron and ships were wood, that was my heyday. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I'm uh, I'm really excited uh, to talk to Scott today. Uh, everybody knows who he is. You've probably read his books. I know you've seen his videos and talks on YouTube, or maybe attended his talks at seminars. Been on his photo walk. I mean, he's been everywhere. He's a Renaissance man and a multitasker. I admire that a lot because I'm a serial tasker. I can do one thing at a time, and he's currently doing about 82 things that I can think of. So Scott, (laughs) welcome and really glad to have you today. Well, thank you. You know, there's no way I can live up to that introduction. So Uh, you're you're living that introduction every day, man. (laughs) Every day. Well, you're very kind. Well, I want to get right to what everybody in the photography world wants to know about you particularly. And that, of course, is food. (laughs) <laughs> um, because you're kind of I like a foodie it. and I want to get the negative stuff out of the way because I, I looked at uh, a little bit of your bio and things and I see you've got the best burger list in the world and I'm an Italian boy. So I love your best restaurants, which are heavily Italian loaded. <laughs> they are, but, but nowhere, nowhere on your list did I see Memphis barbecue and it must be an oversight or well, is it I, possible you haven't experienced <laughs> the height of culinary excellence? Okay, I, I have not. So I, I I went to I've only been to Memphis once in my life. I've been to Tennessee so many times. I don't know how I have not been to Memphis more. But I, I've only been to Memphis once in my life. It was literally probably twenty years. It was in the nineties. It was you know like twenty years, twenty plus years ago. I was teaching at FedEx. I was teaching Photoshop. <laughs> Were you really? That's awesome. <laughs> at, at FedEx. And that was the one and only time. And literally, I flew in. I did the gig and flew home. And they gave and you no barbecue. I got no barbecue. Now, I will say this in defense. My son was in Memphis last week. And his girlfriend lives there. And they went, you know, to see her folks and stuff. And mm-hmm. he said that their barbecue was outstanding. Now, he is from Alabama. And so he's really big on his brand of barbecue. But he said... Memphis barbecue, outstanding. Well, I'm sending you a a package of Memphis barbecue so you can add that to your site because I've. Seen oh it. yeah, <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll we'll arrange to get that to you. My other big question is you 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 have a favorite advertiser I've never tried and that's Buffalo Blast. Is that the oh my gosh, factory? yes, they're so good. Like I, I even got my daughter to eat it and she's, she's very picky and she tried it and she's like, these are like incredible. So it's a, it's a chicken breast hollowed out on the inside and filled with cheese. But then the outside is, is crispy, but like a Buffalo chicken sandwich. Oh, wow. Oh, but it's served just like just a breast. So when you get it, they give you like seven of them. That's quite a large, like it's a, it's a shareable appetizer. They give you like seven of them. And the problem is they're so good that you eat all seven and then your food gets there and you can't eat anything else. <laughs> but it it is the reason I go to Cheesecake Factory. It's the reason why I got Cheesecake Factory gift cards again for Christmas is to go get those <laughs> Buffalo Blasts. Just everybody gives you gift cards. I, I'm actually yes. taking all of my friends out to Cheesecake Factory for their Christmas present this year. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're, we're big fans. We're big fans. Okay, and you've I've tried the Buffalo Blasts? I can't believe I missed it. Oh, they're so good. It's like it's like the Memphis barbecue of cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then the other thing that I really got into was looking at your list of TV shows and things. So I'm going to go to a couple places you, you, you probably don't want to go, but got to get your opinion on the end of Game of Thrones. <sighs> okay. So I have, I have an idea for HBO. I really do. <laughs> can can uh, you scrap can that you last imagine? season and reshoot it? No. No, well, no, not the last season, but the last episode. 
Okay. Because there were some wonderful moments in the last season and and the battle scenes and stuff were were they've they've been called some of the best in the history of movies and television. That being said, the ending was not I think what the fans had hoped for. And I think at the end of the day it's your job to make the fans happy. That's what you mm-hmm. created this series and all. And it's not supposed to make the writers happy and it's not, it's supposed to make the fans happy. Imagine if HBO went back and redid the final episode and gave us the ending we all want. Now there's a guy that went on YouTube and, and did this whole thing about here's how it should have ended. And it is right on the money. You, you everybody I know that's watched it says, Oh, that would have been a spectacular ending. It would have been one of those endings that people celebrate instead of one that everybody gnashes their teeth over. So imagine if HBO went back, redid that last, just the last episode, because redoing the whole season is kind of unrealistic. Right. But they could do that one episode. It would be the most watched event in HBO history. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I think it starts though with Dennis waking up from her nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a good starting place. Uh, yeah. One other question because I'm gonna I'm gonna let my geekiness out. Uh, you a Mandalorian fan? I just watched the first episode and I loved. No, I'm sorry, first two. Okay, loved it, loved it. Just, but I'm only two episodes in, so don't spoil it for I, me. I, I'm not gonna spoil it for you, but I loved it, and uh, I think part of that is because I have a simple mind and I like simple things, and and just like. One episode, nice bite-sized chunk of TV. It's it's the future of Star Wars. It's great. It really is. Yeah, and it's got a, it's got a little flavor of uh, Indiana Jones to it that I like too. Yeah, it does. And and it's short. You know, they're not too long. Yeah, they're like they're, 25, 30 minutes, and they're well produced. The effects are good. It's just it's. I thought it was really entertaining, and uh, uh, it's why I subscribe to Disney Plus. Was to everybody was telling me about I think that's it. Why everybody subscribes to Disney Plus? <laughs> yeah. So, it, but I'm I, only two in, so I'm I'm excited to see the rest. Well, then I won't talk about it anymore because um, I, I want you to enjoy it. That's I, I've had a blast with it. It's it's one of the few things that I've got my son to watch with me, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, yeah. I got a weird thing for you. Uh, okay. You're a black belt in Taekwondo, right? Yeah. Now I I got it uh, when I was in my 40s, and I, I'm not in my 40s anymore. Mm-hmm. So I don't take it out for a spin very often. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, I got I got my first degree black belt in Taekwondo, and then I was literally ready to test for my second degree. And then my son decided he wanted to take karate at the place that was advertising on TV. So he wouldn't go to my Taekwondo studio. He wanted to go to this one. And it was a, it's a big chain. It's very nicely done. And so I went and switched with him to karate, and they handed me my white belt. <laughs> and I, and I uh, had to start all over again. And so I, I, didn't, I didn't finish it off. I, when he quit, I quit too. So I was in it for maybe a year, year and a half. And uh, it, was, it was fun. It was great learning a, you know, a new discipline and all. But uh, I, I, that's as far as I got. Yeah, I, I took Shotokan because I'm short and Taekwondo, you know, the, the kick you in the head thing. Well, that's not happening for me. <laughs> well, but my, to... my question is, <laughs> I've always thought that that helped my photography a little bit as far as being still, holding things, um, may, maybe even just being in the moment. I don't know if the philosophy or any of it seemed to, to, to help you, but I always thought I held things better because of the training. Well, I, I the thing I think that I brought forward was – being able to kick people in the head yeah. <laughs> that. So if something goes bad on a shoot, I look to my assistant and they know here comes a round kick to the head. So, uh, nice. no, but he's tough. He's tough. He's, he can take it. And uh, he, he, blo- he blocks a lot of them. So uh, no, I, I, I wish I'd had that experience. Um, there was not a lot of stillness in Taekwondo. <laughs> yeah. There, there was not a lot. It's, it's go, go, go. So uh, we had, we did full contact sparring and I, I've talked to uh, martial artists that go to schools that they never actually contact. Like you are supposed to pull the punch before you actually touch the other person at all. What? What's the fun uh, in that? That's not I know. But I talk, I know I talk to people all the time and they say, Oh yeah. And I'm like, you need to know how to take a hit. You need to know that you can take a kick to the head and keep going. You don't want to be the first time you get kicked in the head is in an actual fight. Yeah. You know, I'm like, you need to, cause you know, I, I, I trained for six months with a, a very famous martial artist who uh, got me ready for my black belt, uh, especially the sparring stuff. 
and I've been hit by him and and a bouncer from an his brother in law. Brother in law was a bouncer from an Irish bar, mm-hmm. and the most the most physically intimidating person I've ever seen. <laughs> like he he took to, he took his shirt off, and I'm like, I'm not even sure we're the same species. <laughs> this, this, guy, this guy was ripped like you've never seen and all. But luckily, he he did he he knew how to like bar fight. Um, but, but he wasn't, you know, ready. He didn't really know boxing and stuff so well. So I, I was ready to take my black belt. So it was actually an okay situation, but, um, I got beat to crud all the time. I mean, I just got destroyed by this, you know, master martial artist. And finally, you know, you get to this point where you realize I can take a hit and I can keep going and stuff. And I think that's a really important thing. That's why I asked. So a lot of our school was was fighting. In fact, I think for my last six months, I didn't go to any classes that were forms or anything. It was all just sparring because I just really enjoyed it so much. It was a lot of fun. And it was super full contact. <laughs> so you basically were in, in fight club. Just for six months. The rest of the time I was doing forms and I still, I still, but it just became so much fun. Uh, honestly, that when I did that separate training, when this guy taught me, uh, sparring went from being frustrating to being just a ton of fun. And I went to him. Here's why I went to him. So I had an instructor and it was a female instructor who was 17 years old and she was like 102 pounds and, and we would spar and she would just wipe me out. She had a front round kick that was so fast that if I even moved forward towards her, she would just pow right in the stomach. She was like lightning fast with it. And so that's why I went to my friend and, and he's been a friend for years. I'm like, you got to help me fight. I, I'm going and I'm, I'm getting my butt kicked by the 17 year old girl. And, and she's like a hundred pounds and I'm like leaving with bruises and stuff. And he taught me the first day what to do, which was basically just stuff her kicks. Mm-hmm. And from from that point on, everything changed and sparring went from a frustrating, humiliating experience for a guy in his 40s to just being a blast. And it was it really became a lot of fun and it, it did change it all for me. But, you know, that's how education is. That's what learning is. You know, it's like it, when you learn the right things, it can open up a whole new world for you. And it takes something. And photography is a perfect example. I talk to photographers all the time who are frustrated with their their own photography it, you you just kind of have to break through. And when you get that breakthrough, all of a sudden this thing that was very frustrating and you weren't happy with how many keepers you're getting and stuff, it, it can change literally overnight. And so that's what happened to me with Taekwondo. It's just uh, him teaching me how to fight just kind of changed everything. And, uh, and it was good all those years of training since I've never, ever had to fight anyone ever. So, but you know what my wife likes to do? We're in the car and, and somebody will cut us off or something. My wife likes to roll down the window and go, hey, my husband's a black belt. He's going to kick your pee. <laughs> now, she does it. She does it as a joke. She's not really trying to get me in a fight. She would not <laughs> do that. Sure about that? <laughs> but she, she's always like, honey, let's take that black belt for a spin. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> let, me, let me suggest you not do that in Memphis. Um, no. <laughs> no, she yeah, doesn't do it where they can hear it. She does yeah. it for fun. No, she would not really pull up next to somebody. But when they drive, they're driving away with their windows closed. And she's like, my husband's going to kick your. But she just does it just strictly for laughs. My wife is hilarious. So it's. Typical well, stuff. Know, I'm an old short guy, but with the windows rolled up, I talk some bad shit. I really <laughs> Don't cut we me all? Off. No. Don't we all? <laughs> all right. Now, this is this is where I in, in in finding out about you, I I got intimidated earlier because I'm a, like I said, I'm a I'm a uni tasker. I can do one thing well, and then I'm here going okay. And then when he toured with his band in Europe, and I just about like spit my coke in disgust. <laughs> you, you you play like five instruments, right? Uh, I play four pretty, pretty, pretty fairly competently. I play uh, uh, drums, keyboards, bass, and guitar. And I have a, a recording studio at my house, and I do a lot of recording. I spend a lot of too much time doing it, l- literally till like two in the morning. Often, uh, well, anything and, worth doing is worth doing until two in the morning, though. I, oh yeah. Well, I start late. I want to make sure everyone's gone to bed, <laughs> everyone's asleep. <laughs> you know, I do wear headphones out of you know respect. Right. But uh, yeah, I've got guitars, basses, keyboards. I've got a drum set. I have everything I need right there. I've got really nice recording equipment, and I just have the greatest time. I just love it. I write a little bit, not, not on your scale, but I find depending on what I want to write. I start my playlist to get me in that mood. Do you do that kind of thing? And do you actually like, oh, I need a break. I'm going to go play for a while as a, as a writer's block treatment. 
Oh, absolutely. For, for certain. They'll become a point where I'm just like, ah, and I do, I have to walk away from the keyboard and I go pick up a keyboard or, or right, I pick up the other keyboard. Pick up, you're more, more likely a guitar. Guitar is kind of my hobby. So, uh, I, I call myself a struggling guitarist, but it's, it's cause I'm just not that good at it. I'm, I can, you know, I'm good enough, but I'm not anywhere where I want to be. Cause I play in a band and so I, I, I play guitar on stage, but it's just kind of like, I'm not that good at this. So uh, it's something I struggled, but I'm, I'm really seeing since I got this recording studio up and running, my playing is, is come a long way. It's getting a lot better because this is going to sound stupid, but to, the, the software I use is called logic pro X it's from Apple. And it is, I would say the Photoshop of audio. It has depth like Photoshop. It has so much to it. So I thought I'm going to learn this software by recreating from scratch and playing all of the parts to all of my favorite classic rock songs from the 70s and 80s. Oh, that's awesome. So so that's what I do. But here's what really makes it hard. I try to make it sound exactly like the actual recording. So if you were listening to it in my car, you wouldn't know it was the real thing. Now, I don't. Now, here's what my secret weapon is. I download the vocal tracks from YouTube. So if I want to do Living on a Prayer by Bon Jovi, I can go and get John Bon Jovi singing just him, just his vocals off of YouTube. Oh, sweet. People use different kinds of software and stuff, and they extract the vocals. And so then I have to play the bass, the drums, the guitars, the keyboards, the horns, the strings, whatever else all the parts are. You're, you're the living, whole band. <laughs> I'm the whole band. For Living on a Prayer, I had to get a talk box put the tube in my mouth and do and learn how to use That's a talk awesome. box and do the whole thing. And so I just finished photograph by Def Leppard this week. And so uh, it, that was a challenge to get the snare drum sound right. Cause they use a this stacked uh, snare drum that uses a regular snare and then a noise sound and some wood and a, a synthesizer snare and all. But I finally was able to get, Did you get it all together on your back. And I timed one arm behind my back. Oh, oh that's that was. You are me. wrong for that, Joey. That, oh that's God. not. That's not right. Hey, that I, is so wrong. Hey, I mean, can, you I, might can, be I, can I? Can Let I me stop? be very clear. That was Joey Miller who right. said that. And Joey, not me. All right, and Jeff Leopard. Okay, can I can I say something here? Can I just interrupt, please? This is the best interview. This is the most fun interview. We're talking about <laughs> we're talking about stuff I never get to talk about. This is, That's what this, I wanted. I mean, this is talk best, about Photoshop all day. I know best interview ever. I don't mind talking about Photoshop, but this is more fun. <laughs> this is this is I'm having a blast. This is this is for me just awesome. <laughs> and, and you know what? I, I, I the reason I did this was I said, you know, who wants to click and hear us do audio when they can click on YouTube and hear you talk about that stuff? I want to talk about you because this is cool. And just so this is recorded. Now that we've talked about all the instrument he plays, how he does the whole songs for everything else, I'm sitting here going, I wrote a book once. <laughs> <laughs> hey, most people never write a book. That's quite an accomplishment. I've that, never written a book. That's true. But I mean, Aaron, Joey's just, never written a book. <laughs> this is just so awesome to me because it's like you are all over everywhere and I love it. And it's uh, <laughs> uh, my, my thing is I do one thing at a time. and I have a five-year attention span. So my whole life is divided up into five-year blocks. But it was wow. one thing for each five years. Oh, that's good. So this fascinates me that you like, boo, I'm going – Recreate all the backtracks to Def Leppard. Okay, I've got one music question that I think everybody needs to know. All right. Which Van Halen? David Lee Roth or Sammy? Oh, David Lee Roth. Yes. All right. Yes. Yeah. It's not. Uh, now, let me say this. Not only do I do I like Sammy Hagar uh, as a musician, I think Sammy Hagar is a pretty nice guy. I've listened to interviews with him, and he sounds like a very – down to earth, very level headed guy. I'm not a big Sammy Hagar fan of his music. I like a couple of songs he did, but but I think uh, he's a really really nice guy. That being said, it's not Van Halen with Sammy Hagar. It's another band that has Van Halen people in it. Yeah, but but Van Halen is David Lee Roth. Now, unfortunately, have you heard David Lee Roth with them now? I don't think I want to. Would that not kind of ruin everything? <laughs> it, it it will absolutely. Something has happened. I don't think it's to his voice. I think it's to his hearing. Yeah, because that's probably so. he does not. It's not that he can't hit the high notes because he still hits some pretty high notes. But he is singing so out of pitch, you don't even recognize the song. You're like, 
dude, what happened? Go to YouTube and listen to like current Van Halen songs or watch them on like the Today Show or wherever the, one of these places they've done. He's singing these songs and it's like, he's not anywhere near the pitch. And, and I can't tell you any old rocker that I've heard that it, it's because it's not a vocal problem. He, he, you can go back and listen to him from the eighties. They there's YouTube videos of him singing and he yeah, sounds with his awesome vocal tracks and they're amazing. He sounds incredible. And so here he is, same guy hitting the same notes and he's singing Panama and you're like, dude, what happened? It, it's, it's gotta be a hearing thing. Cause he's not hearing pitch. He's not oh, hearing. It, it absolutely but, is. I, I, one of my five year forays, I used to be a physician. So the loss of hearing, that's the first thing you see is you cannot sing. Uh, oh, let me lose, tell you. <laughs> especially with a rocker, because you lose all the high stuff. So you don't hear the high. Yeah. So, so the idea of carrying a melody is almost impossible. So it's it's kind of sad because, you know, he was so great for so long. And now you're like, whoa. Yeah. Um, but then there's other people out there. You know, Axl Rose is out there tour and I would listen to him. He sounds different, but man, he's hitting the notes. And uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of some of these guys I listen to, you know, it's a great series. Can I, can I plug a series? It's not mine. Yeah, please. Is, you plug so, yours Dar- too. so listen to this. Daryl Hall from Hall and Oates ha- did a show called, I think it's called at Daryl's house. He and his band, he's got a killer band, right? They bring in musicians, big, big superstar musicians, and they play their songs, so his band plays their songs. So Kenny Loggins comes in, and they play Footloose, and they, his band learns all the songs. Man, oh, that's they, awesome. But Kenny Loggins sings like as good as he's ever sung in his life. The guy's like 71, and dude, he's he's phenomenal. And then they had the OJs. He, they brought the OJs in, the three guys. No band, it's just Daryl Hall and his band. Now, Daryl Hall will sing a verse or he'll sing a chorus, and he's got a – You'll get a whole new respect for Daryl Hall. That guy can sing not just Daryl Hall songs, but like everybody else's songs. He brings in female vocalists, male vocalists. It is incredible. The audio is amazing. If you really want to binge watch some YouTube, go watch uh, Live from Daryl's House by Daryl Hall, and you'll hear just amazing performances in Daryl's house. (laughs) I'm going to do that this afternoon. Oh, yeah. You will love it. It's amazingly good. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break to uh, pay the bills. I don't know. And then we'll be back in just a second and talk about a few more things with Scott Kelby. Woo! And now, Lens Reynolds brings you a meditation moment. Close your eyes. Lean back and listen to my voice. You feel yourself getting sleepy, relaxed, drifting on a cloud. You love this podcast. You want to give this podcast a five-star rating. You want to write a positive review of it and even subscribe to it. You know that will bring you a feeling of joy and contentment. When I count to three, you will wake up refreshed and go straight to the review page. One, two, three. I have a house in uh, L.A., you know, lower Alabama. So, <laughs> so I know a bit about being an Alabama football fan. I just want to know if you're doing okay. <laughs> uh, we're okay. Okay. <laughs> I went to the bowl game. My, my wife for Christmas bought my son and I 50 yard line club seats for the uh for nice the, for the uh the game. Now, two years ago, I actually got to shoot the game. I got to shoot the college national championship. Uh, but this year we didn't even get to go to the championship because obviously Alabama, our quarterback was was injured and right. um so we lost to LSU. Even with our backup quarterback, we just barely lost, but we did. And so we went to a bowl game and against Michigan, and we got to go watch that game last week. And it was really, really fun. My son and I had a great time. There was lots of roll tides. But, yeah, it's, it was sad. Did they win? They did yeah, win. Michigan? Oh, yeah, they, Michigan, they right? stomped Michigan. The, the co-owner of Lens Rentals, my son Drew, is a Michigan grad. <laughs> and uh, yes. he deserves some credit for the Alabama win because he texted me when I think it was 13-13 
and said something on the order of, I think we're going to pull this one out. <laughs> oh, 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 that yeah. famous Sakala Juju. It is. The Sakala Juju came down. Oh. But uh, that that is a really good segue because in looking at your, your, your photography work, the one thing that jumped out at me is different and and I just absolutely love is your sports photography. And I don't think, I think there's some people out there that don't realize you're a really awesome sports photographer. Well, thank you. Thanks. I, I love sports. If you're a sports fan, uh, you know, and I'm mostly a football fan. I'm a football fanatic. Uh, I'm sitting here looking at football helmets where I'm sitting in my home right now. Right. But uh, yeah, if you're a football fan, uh, it, it is uh, it's <laughs> getting to shoot something you love just takes it up a big, big notch. I have finessed myself into uh, getting to sideline shoot. I'm a University of Memphis fan. I don't use any of the photos, though. I just basically get to go on the sideline and act like I'm doing it. But your photos, I mean, there's some really amazing stuff, a lot of close-ups, good sideline things. But you post-process at least some of your sports photography. Am I correct? All, all of my sports photography. Okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I do want to say this. Uh, uh, you're allowed to post-process your sports photography when you sit in the room at the, you know, there's a a press room, a media room, a photographer's room in every stadium. And everybody is there. That's what that's what we're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. We're, I don't think really anybody sends it out of the camera. I think we all, the, the first thing that everybody has to do in sports photography is crop. Right. Mm -hmm. It is an absolute must because you can't control the, the, where the game is. And all of a sudden there's a long bomb down the field and you can't just go, well, I'm not going to take that picture because it's, I, I won't be able to see the player. No, mm -hmm. you take the picture and you crop it in so you can see it. Um, that's why having a lot of megapixels in a sports camera is important. Now, a lot of megapixels for a sports camera is 20 megapixels. <laughs> so right. that's, yeah. It's weird, but, but because you need those fast shutter speeds and things, but yeah, cropping is the first thing that everybody does. I say we spend more time doing cropping than anything else. It is absolutely key. And uh, it's great if the play is on your end of the field, but if it takes off and goes the other way, you still have to capture the shot and you can't just go, Oh, well, <laughs> he ran mm -hmm. away. He ran away from the perfect uh, uh, length for me, so I didn't take the shot. No, a it's lot of the too far. Shots, yeah, a lot of the passes are you know downfield, and you you've got to crop. So everybody's cropping. So yeah, and uh, we're also now there. There's kind of a set of rules that we go by, and the rule is is you can only add footballs to the picture. You can't take – no, that's not – that, that is not well, – no. No, there's – basically, there's an overriding rule, and that is you can do things to the photo that make it look more like it did in real life. Right. What you can't do is do things that make it look less like it did. For example, you know, you're shooting in – especially if you shoot in RAW, your images come in looking kind of flat. They don't look very vibrant, you know – the idea behind raw is that your camera does nothing to the photo, right? It's just the raw image. So if you're shooting in raw, the very first thing you have to do is bring back contrast and some vibrancy. So the color looks right. Not so it looks better than it did just to get it to look what it looks like when you're there. Like when you're there and I, I shoot, uh, I was shooting for the Falcons last week. Mm -hmm. And so the, the Falcons red is a very, very vibrant red. And when you, bring those images in. They don't look like they, they the red doesn't look right. That's not the red right. for the Falcons. It's not the red of the Buccaneers when they wear the red jerseys. So you, you have to do something to get the color looking like it should. And by should means like what it looked like when you're out on the field, you lose sharpness in the camera, especially when you resize your images for the media, you're going to lose sharpness. You've got to bring that sharpness back. Everybody's sharpening. Everybody's adding a bit of contrast it's a very limited number of things that we can do as long as the things make the photo look more like real life. That's, that's our, so we're everybody. I don't know. I don't know a sports photographer that is not, I'm not saying there's not out there. I'm saying, I don't know one that doesn't do a basic set of post-processing and certainly cropping to every single image before they turn them in. Right. Cause it's still, it's still considered like reportage, like uh Oh yeah. Ethics. Oh yeah. Now, now if I'm showing it for my portfolio or my blog and it's not reportage, it's not being right, used as a right. news thing, then I might, 
I might like remove something on the field that is, you know, like a ref. No, like, <laughs> you know, like a, a boom mic coming in from the side or something. Mm-hmm. I might just take that out. But when I turned it in, I was not able to do that. So what about I, I blurring to... a background if you want to, take, for emphasis, when you talk about sharpening, if you blur the background, is that legal? For reporters? <sighs> I, I I wouldn't do that. I, I think that's, I think if you're using a Gaussian blur at any time, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good thing. Yeah. I, I, now, I'm not saying that no one's done it. I don't know of anybody that's, I haven't caught anybody doing it. I, I've never walked by somebody's machine and saw them, you know, running like uh, Luminar or something. <laughs> 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 running some plug in on their sports photos, but. Yeah, but I, I my first thought was, OK, it's not as sharp as I'd like. So let me make everything else blurrier and then my sharpness looks better. But OK, I mean, that that in portraiture is a real thing, but I'm not well, sure it, that it would go well when you do sports for your portfolio, which is what really jumped out at me. That's a different world and you have a lot more freedom there. I, I do. But honestly, there's just not that much to do to sports photos. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah, I, I might maybe add a little clarity or bring out some texture, but there's, there's just not much you can do to a sports photo. You know, it's, it's, I'm not going to do any of the compositing or stuff like that. So you're just, there's just, and it's not that you can't, there's just not that much that you would want to do, you know, it's, yeah really cropping it and just trying to make sure it's sharp. I might do some spot sharpening. So for example, I might, let's just say I have a shot that I've cropped in on. And if you do crop in and it's downfield, it may not be super sharp. I'll, I'll sharpen the photo, but then I'll go back again with a brush and spot sharpen. Maybe the logo on the helmet gotcha. okay. or the, the, the rivets on the side where the face masks and stuff are, just to to give an, it's called creative sharpening. I and mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that as a joke. It's actually called creative sharpening because there, there's three levels of sharpening. There's capture sharpening, which is kind of like I'm replacing the sharpening that would have been applied if I shot in JPEG. So when you shoot in raw, there's no sharpening. Your camera turns the sharpening off. So your, your photos look, they don't look as good as the JPEG. So the, the first thing is replace that sharpening that you lost in the camera. Creative sharpening is I want you to look over here or I want to use this for an effect because our eyes are drawn to the brightest thing in the photo and the sharpest thing. So if you want someone to look at a particular player, you make that player's helmet or whatever nice and sharp. And then there's output sharpening is the third one, which is what you do when you go to actually save the file. You do another level of sharpening based on where it's going to go. Because to print, it gets one kind of sharpening. It's going to Instagram, it gets a different kind of sharpening. So there's three levels of sharpening that that we do so but outside of sharpening making the colors vibrant and cropping what could you do to a sports photo yeah you know, it's just it's not like a landscape or yeah. something where you can make the clouds really angry <laughs> it's like yeah. you're just it's, a, a painterly effect is really not going to do much. yeah no no well and and then the other type of photography that you do that that really just hit a chord with me and and i own one of your works is is the great indoor series oh is that coming out as a book? I I heard it was, and then I heard it wasn't. So yeah, you, so so it's 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 a weird situation. I had a book deal with a European uh, coffee table book uh, company, mm-hmm. and the the deal just kind of fell apart. It, it's it's a weird story, so I won't go into it at all. But we had an agreement, and then the agreement changed. <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad because I would I would have I would have been one of the first to get one. But I'm going to make it come out as a coffee book. I'm 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 looking at some other ideas right now. So because it's awesome. done, it's all done, it's all ready to go. In fact, I delivered all the uh, the images and the layouts and everything to the team that was going to publish it. And then weird things happened, and then the the owner died, and oh, all, wow. all okay. kinds of weird things happened. So I would say that it's it's stuck in photo book limbo, but it will, it will, it will be coming out. And believe me, you'll, you'll know, cause I'll be putting it everywhere. I, I really put a lot of heart and soul time and energy and money into, to making that book, uh, which is just for people who aren't familiar with it. It is a, it celebrates classic interiors from all over the world. So it's opera houses, theaters, um, cathedrals. It's, you know, just any of these uh, classic architecture that's still around but it's not shot. I didn't shoot it as an architectural photographer. I shot it as a travel photographer. So it has a different sensibility. And it is the whole world. I mean, you went everywhere to do this stuff. 
Well, I went to as many places as they would allow me. Yeah. So. It's kind of breathtaking everywhere that you went. Some of those places aren't going to be around much longer, too. Yeah. And and I'm still working on it. I just shot uh, for it recently. I was able to get into uh, – there's an incredible library at the University of Washington in Seattle. And it looks like a Harry Potter – kind of thing. It's as I would say it's as close to the Harry Potter school, or I guess I don't know what's called Hogwarts. Uh, yeah. Uh it's as close to that as you'll find in the US. Uh, the one that actually inspired it is in Dublin, Ireland. And I couldn't get in there. I, I didn't yeah, I didn't give them enough they said I needed more give them more time. Uh I only gave them like two weeks notice and I apparently they need a year. Oh, um, <laughs> but the this well, in Seattle move slow over yeah. there. They're not, you know. But I get I got to shoot the one in Seattle. It was absolutely beautiful. And I had to ask the person that was with us, that was our caretaker. I said, "Was this built as a church and then converted into a library?" She's like, "Nope. It was built from the ground up as a library. And it looks like picture a beautiful European cathedral full of books. Wow. That's what it looks like. It's incredible. Oh. So I was excited to add that one to the book here just recently." Do you have any uh, you have any favorite spots from the book? Yeah, well, I really enjoyed getting to shoot the the Albert Hall in London. That was really exciting. I had gone to see Eric Clapton there uh, years ago, and I, when I'm there, I'm thinking, man, I would love to come back here for a photo shoot. And when I was going to London for another trip to to teach over there, I uh, a friend was able to get me in to uh, to photograph it. So that was really exciting. That was cool. Um, and just the and, history. And that one has the best title of any of your works. I just I just got to throw it out. the The Albert Hall picture is titled "Now We Know How Many Holes It Takes to Fill." Yep. <laughs> and that to me, at my age was the greatest title ever. And then I looked over at Joey, who's like, huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just I mean, so disappointed in Joey on that because I had such I mean, high I, I hopes. I like the Beatles. They're, they're cool. Yeah. Right, oh, buddy. yeah. No, no, you failed. <laughs> <laughs> you have failed basic Beatology. <laughs> but that is that is a gorgeous picture. That's actually the one that I have. And the, the colors in that, from the lights to the seats, it's just... It's, it's kind of Christmassy, but it's beautiful. Yeah. It, well, it was the they uh, they they were having a competition, a dance competition at the time that we were there, and the PR people were nice enough to to they they were going to give us thirty minutes, and they gave us like an hour and a half. They were awesome, but they were testing the lighting for this ballroom competition, and so the, the lights in there would change every few minutes. Literally, the ceiling would be green, oh. and then it would be yellow, and then it would be orange, and lights are going everywhere. We kind of had to shoot in between it, but you know, it's like, hey, you know, they're. <laughs> I was so thrilled that they let me in. I'm like, I don't care that the ceiling's green. I'm going with it. I like the green. But how many shots did you take? Do you remember? Oh, yeah, I took hundreds. Well, I bracket, yeah. I bracketed every shot. So I did, I did a three shot bracket. You know, two shots on two stops under exposed normal and two over, uh, just to make sure because. You want to be able to capture the lights without them blowing out. Mm -hmm. And you want to be able to have all the detail and stuff. So it is, uh, I don't want to call it an HDR, but I guess it kind of is. But it's not, I didn't use any HDR software. It's just compiled into one photo in Lightroom, which right. means when you're done, it looks the same. Like when you mm -hmm. compile it, you don't look at it and go, wow, that looks like Harry Potter like everybody used to do. It just looks like the same photo, but you have a greater tonal range. and You can do more to the photo without damaging it. Yeah, that photo does definitely not have an HDR look to it. No. It just looks like, oh, what perfect exposure. Well, you're very kind. Thank you. Thanks. I love loved taking that. That was a, a lot of fun. Great memories from that trip. And the, the and all the photos, the, the books, I, I'm a book, I'm a book of file. And just the, the libraries and the books, it was amazing to see. I love the series. So Oh well, thank you when, very much. When the book comes out when the book comes out, I want, so just please let me know. Oh, don't, don't worry. <laughs> All right, we have tied up a ton of your time, but I got one one more question before we go, if you don't mind. Oh, of course. You have been doing this for two decades, and I was kind of uh, involved at the start when it was about Photoshop and post-processing images. and That has morphed over the years to dozens of programs and ways to handle workflows and subscription models and buy and everything else. My my question for you is, you've been doing this for 20 years and seen all these changes. How has the teaching changed for you? Or is it the same, basically? Well, it's an inter that's an interesting question. When I, when I first started teaching Photoshop, there weren't many people that knew it. It, it was very new. And uh, it was, you know, still like, wow, you know. 
So today, Photoshop is, is such a part of our culture. It's so well known. And so many people know Photoshop. You know, my daughter uses Photoshop. My son uses Photoshop. Not because I taught them. In fact, they will not let me teach them. Of course not. No, they they have their own ways of learning that are are mystical and beyond me. But anyway. Well, and if and if you teach them, it can't be worthwhile because you're the parent. So. No, of, of course. So, but um, it, it's such a part that you wind up teaching it differently because you're not so much teaching the the essentials and the basics because so many people have that now it's very specific when i started teaching photoshop it was a tool for graphic designers photographers did not use it at all i was a professional graphic designer at the time when i started using photoshop i was making my living as a, a designer i had a design firm uh mm -hmm. and we designed basically advertising and annual reports and just you know all that kind of stuff and so uh it was many, many, many years later that photographers finally said, hey, you know, so it it it, it is it has evolved to where instead of being just teaching it as a graphic design tool, which I still do to some extent, it, it is a photographer's tool. But what's weird is we're going through a weird evolution right now. So right now, Lightroom is like on fire. Right. Everybody's using Lightroom and it's uh, Lightroom is so much of what we do. But I'll tell you this, uh, I, I'm, I'm on the seminar tour right now where I'm going across the country and it's a photography tour, but I use, of course, during the day, some Lightroom and some mm -hmm. Photoshop. And at the end of the day, one of the things that I talk about is, look, Lightroom is awesome. It makes my photos brighter. It makes my photos darker. I can change my white balance and I can uh, make my colors more vibrant and I can change the contrast. I can adjust the whites and the blacks. And it does a lot of cool things like that. But Photoshop is where the magic is. When you want to do really cool stuff, when you want to do stuff that makes your jaw drop and other people's jaws drop, it's still Photoshop. Less photographers use Photoshop today than probably in the last five years because they're all migrating to Lightroom. So I'm trying to lead a two, I'm trying to lead a renaissance on two fronts. Okay. Is for A, is photographers to realize how important Photoshop still is. It just does different stuff. And a very common question is, well, I already have Lightroom. Do I need Photoshop? Or, or I'm already paying for Photoshop as part of my monthly subscription, but I know I need to learn it, but, but they don't really know why. So I'm trying to show people all the things that Photoshop does that are so far beyond what Lightroom does. So that's one. My other mm -hmm. thing I'm trying to do is be an ambassador for print. I, I'm really big on actually making prints and why prints are historically important and important on so many different levels. And so uh, I talk about that quite a bit. And so those are the two things that I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, very into right now is, is helping photographers to understand why Photoshop is so important and, and why it's where the magic is. And just encouraging everyone and teaching uh, how to print. Because I right. think print is just incredibly important for all sorts of reasons that go beyond the scope of what we have left in this in this like, podcast. Right. But but I, I I could not agree more. I think that's so wonderful, um, particularly the print point. I, I, you know, I, I love hearing. I can't tell any difference in in this camera, that camera, this lens, that lens. I'm like you're looking at a 1200 pixel JPEG. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. It's a print is where it's at. Yes, awesome. it is. I'm also a brand ambassador for Cheesecake Factory and their buffalo, yes. and their buffalo <laughs> you should blast. Be. So make sure I know you that's download a lie the coupon. Because if you were, you'd weigh 700 pounds. None of us could I, afford to be a brand I, ambassador for Cheesecake yeah, Factory. Yeah, I, I would be in a circus sideshow. Like. Oh, me too. Well, me it, too. If you come down and visit, just know that Cheesecake Factory is right up the road. It's at the mall, oh, like man. three miles up the road. No, no. I'm oh, sending man. him barbecue first and that will draw him to visit we send that, prob that probably of will of course that probably will draw me yeah uh before we go anything you want to talk about what you're working on where people need to go see well i got a brand new book out so that's exciting i have a a, a book called the natural light photography book so it's a whole book on for people who are who do nothing but shoot natural light and so you mean people who don't have flashes Right, because I have a book called The Flash Book for those people. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> so, uh, so I've got this Natural Light book. It just came out right before the holidays, and it's doing really, really well. It's been like the number one new release on Amazon for like a month, and it's it winds up topping all kinds of categories on Amazon. And the the uh, 
The initial reviews have been just fantastic. I'm very excited about that. I'm writing another book as always. So the book that you and I mentioned earlier off the air, we're we're just getting ready to go, was my uh, digital photography book, which was was the best-selling book uh, in history on digital photography. I am uh, doing an update of that. So that book hasn't been updated in a number of years, and I'm working literally today, right before we started this. I got up early, and I've been writing and writing and writing on, on a major update to that book. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, and I've got some other books coming out this year, but that's, that's, so that's the, the one that I have currently out, uh, is the natural light. And I'm working on this uh, digital photography, which I hope will be out probably in March. That's all. And the previous version, is that not the best selling photography book of all time? Yeah. It's, I'm, it's, I'm around there. it's crazy, but it, yeah, it, it really, rest, that's why I want to redo it. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's an important book. It's sent my kid to college. So it's, uh, it was one of those books that photography teachers told their students about. Um, I've talked to so many people who that was the book that they used in their college course. Mm-hmm. And so I, I can see that. So uh, it, it just turned out to be, you know, of course, when you write a book, you you don't have any expectations that it's going to do what it did. I was just, you know, I hope it goes OK. And it just went ridiculous. And we did a part one, which is the one I'm redoing. Then we did a part two, a part three, a part four, a part five, a best of, a box set. We, you know, it, it, <laughs> I, I've seen the box set, so I yeah, knew there was, there was it, like six it, volumes. It, it got a life of its own, and I'm very grateful to all the people that recommended it and bought it. And it was it's a very fun book to write. I'm, I'm loving doing the up, update. And, of course— you know, I think the last version came out in like 2009 or something. So you're looking back. Things ba- have happened since then. Yeah, you're looking back and you're like, oh, my gosh, you know, I use a different technique now or I use this. So it's exciting to be able to bring it back to life, you know, with your you know current techniques and the things that you you know now. And just the, also uh, having taught it for 10 years since then, you know, you found better ways to communicate it. Because at the end of the day, the <laughs> I'm not trying to impress my peers. I'm trying to I'm trying to help people take better pictures and I really want them to cuz you know if if the book works, if you get results, that that's what it's all about. And I think that's why that book has been a success is because people could really see a, a difference in their photography. So trying to break it down and make it easy and clear and have people go, "Yes, that makes sense. I can do that. I'm going to do that." You know, that's what I'm trying to do is how can I make it Really simple and talk to my reader like I'm talking to a friend. I was I was just about to say that because you said your books are used as textbooks in some college courses. And I wanted everybody to realize they don't read like college textbooks. They're fun reads. Yeah, I can't imagine what some of the teachers think because, you know, the first page of every chapter is not anything. It, it is a mental break. And so I just make up stuff. And my my editor calls it stream of conscious writing. It's like whatever came to your head. Joyce the unconscious. It, it has such a legion of fans, those dumb in chapter introductions, that I kid you not, I have a book on sale at Amazon that is nothing but my chapter introductions. Oh, wait, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. What's the name of that book? I think it's called Don't Buy This Book. <laughs> Hang on, I'm going to tell you the exact name. It's terrible. <laughs> but I have a new version of it. Hang on, let me find it. I'm going to tell you the exact name. But it don't is buy not, this book. May be the best book title. It may it may take over the Albert Hall. Yeah, it's I gotta find it. But it is yeah. It's like don't buy this book. It has nothing nothing of value. Hang on, I'm, I'll get you the. I exact. like it. But I, it's it's I immediately I'm going to buy this book. It, it's something that bad, and you can get the uh, Kindle version, so you don't have to wait for the print version. And uh, perfect. I'm looking for it now. I've written a lot of books, so I'm doing a lot of scrolling here. Do Do you even know the number of books you've written? My my uh, my editor Kim, so she's been my editor for many years. Uh, she says, according to her, she's gone back and counted them all. She says we're coming up on 100. Oh, now I only write four or five a year now, but there was a time where I had written 12 a year, and there it is. Here's what it's called. Buy this book of chapter intros, even though you won't learn anything. Now well, that's perfect. Now it only has. I, as soon as we're off the, Joey's already ordered, and I'm looking. He's on his phone on Amazon. He's ordering it right now. All right, and I'm right behind him. And so one of the reviews gave it a one star review, and it says, "I should have believed the title. Indeed, you will learn nothing." <laughs> <laughs> Like I so. said it right on the top. 
I screwed up. I told you the truth. Yeah, and then this other person says it's super funny and they love it and all, and the other person's like, fans of lame jokes. <laughs> Trans, oh, that's me. Transgently uh, related to digital photography and Photoshop might might find it amusing. I didn't. That's perfect. so. Here's a, here's what I need. Wait. I need a good review on this book. <laughs> it's sitting. Joey, it's, I can handle that. It's sitting at two stars, so it's got a five star and a one star. Which it sounds like that should make a three star, but it doesn't. It's a two star? No, it's a two star on okay. Amazon, and it, it's and it's 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 it is it's stupid. Uh, now, I, I do want to read you something from the front cover because it, 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 this guy bought the book. And on the front cover, it says, a hand-picked, solicitous, yet subtly gelatinous collection, subtly gelatinous collection of the best of Scott's trademark quirky chapter introductions from 10 years of his books. There are no actual chapters. It's an entire book of just those intros. I'm not making this up by it anyway. <laughs> and, and i'm going to well I, and that, leave a review all, all everybody the, the the legion of thousands listening to Lynn. yeah t two ratings is, is is pretty bad anyway it's not the print book anymore now it's just a kindle book it's just you know, like just well, that's perfect for me but uh yeah it's it's really stupid but <laughs> that's right up my alley really stupid stuff is great if stupid humor really strikes a chord this with you perfect. it's great but if you're a serious person it's it's misery <laughs> it's well, th th that to me is the greatest compliment when i when i have somebody say i was reading it at work and laughed out loud or somebody looked at me while i was reading it that's the greatest compliment i think you can get well i i, I i'm so grateful that somebody gets my quirky sense of humor but apparently some people do not, and those <laughs> big stinking one star hanging there like you know a moon in the sky. Well, thank you so much again. I'll have uh, some barbecue get sent down. To I you am soon. looking. That's very gracious of you. I am very much looking forward to it. All right, and again, thank you so much for the time. It's been a real pleasure. Absolutely. At the end of this, we'll be linking to several of the uh, pages that we talked about today, and I recommend you go particularly look at some of the work that Scott does because I think a lot of you know who he is and you haven't seen his work, and it's phenomenal. So thank you again. It's been a pleasure, and uh, we'll see you next episode. Thanks for listening to the Lens Rentals podcast. If you have any questions or comments, let us know at podcast at lensrentals.com. I'll leave you with this quote from Joe McAnally. If you want something to look interesting, don't light all of it.